How's everybody doing today? Wonderful. How many people were up late last night driving? Good. How many people will be late tonight driving? Better. Louder. Okay. That's it. That's it. Yeah, what we're going to teach you today is we're going to kind of just kind of introduce you to this instrument. Uh, this instrument really isn't an instrument that gets played at, at these lively drum circles. This is an instrument that will either begin or open a circle possibly, uh, but more than likely in this environment it usually kind of comes back out, you know, three or four, sometimes seven in the morning. <laughs> and uh, it's a lot of fun, and it, it's an instrument that really doesn't get played enough, and uh, there's a number of different ways of playing it. Uh, but to start off, a frame drum, which is what these are, is defined by the diameter of the drum being bigger than the depth of the drum. And uh, according to a lot of history or a lot of research that's been done, uh, the, drum, the frame drum kind of came from the grain sieve. Mm. Oh, you know, and then basically somebody put a skin on it or something like that, and they were able to make sound with it. The traditional playing style for a frame drum in, in a nomadic country where they're going to be doing a lot of traveling and stuff like that would be to play it up here because you're on your animal and you're going to be playing it while you're traveling through across the desert or whatever. And so you'd be playing it up here up like, um, like this. Now, there's a number of different playing styles, but this is much, pretty much like an open playing style because you, you're, you really can't do a lot with this hand when you're holding it up. You can kind of you can kind of get just that, that click thing, but it's, you're really just doing a lot of support. So a lot of the, the beginning rhythms that occurred were very open rhythms, very uh, simple rhythms to play that you could play with just one hand. The, uh, the, the mother of all Middle Eastern rhythms, and that's where I'm going to be going over is a lot of the Middle Eastern stuff, uh, is a rhythm called Maksum. And Maksum is a very much a simple rhythm, and, and, and these are rhythms that were based upon you know, natural things that people saw in their environment, whether that was the gait of an animal or any type of activity they could mimic because of the rhythmical cycle of it. So Maksum would start out with making a bass. Now I make a bass note on the frame drum using my thumb. And basically what I'm doing is I'm gonna just like turn the doorknob. You know? you just kinda kinda get that thumb in there. And it doesn't stick on the drum, it just kinda bounces off. And it's just like turning a doorknob. And it should have a nice resonant sound. Now the other sound you're going to make in this instance, uh, we call I call it a grab, and I'm going to be using Doombeck vocalization just because I'm more familiar with that. Uh, there are other sounds or, or definitions of what these particular sounds on the drum may be, uh, may be called. And a lot of that depends upon what culture you're talking about, what country, and, and so you'll hear lots of different variations uh, if you really invest any time into this instrument. And so there's no real right or wrong way, it's just you know what certain people are accustomed to. And so you may hear other things called, like, instead of a tech, you might call it here called a, uh, a, a, a talk, or, you know, it's just little things. You can really use whatever you want, is what you're going to. But uh, the next strike that we're going to do is, it's basically, you're just going to be hitting the tips of your fingers, kind of like palming a basketball, in a sense, you know, and you, you're just kind of grabbing it, and your fingers are sticking to the drum, and it has that, have that nice, crisp, muted sound on it. And like I said, we call this a grab. Five fingers coming down at the same time. So those are two particular sounds, and with those two sounds, you can now play the simple rhythm called Maksum. And Maksum goes bass, grab, grab, bass, grab. So now if you were to play that continuously, it would go. It's a very open rhythm. An open rhythm is defined by a lot of space in between the strikes. You'll hear a lot of good drummers talk about how it's not how many when you're hitting the drum that makes the rhythm, it's when you're not hitting the drum that makes the rhythm. Because that really defines the flavor of the rhythm, the swing, however you want to look at it. Another playing style for this instrument 
you know, obviously what they did was when the Doom Bat came along, they took this playing style and trying to stay within something that's familiar to them, what they did was they just kind of rotated the drum around and put it on their knee. So that's why you'll see all the Doom, well, the traditional Middle Eastern Doom Bat players will have it up on their leg, whether they're, well, they're, they're non-dominant legs. So if they're right-handed, it'll be on their left leg more than likely, and vice versa. So what I usually do is I'll play my frame drum on my leg because it's just a little more comfortable and you can do more things because you've just freed up you know, your whole thumb now and now you can you can do more of this type of stuff and this particular strike on the drum in the Doombeck vocalization is called a ka in frame drum people will argue about that it's my class and I'll say what I want <laughs> <laughs> so in this instance we're going to call this a ka and again all you're doing is you're really when it's on your knee like this you're just trying to hit just that just the edge very much just the tip of that edge because this is a very intimate instrument it's not a, a powerful instrument in the sense like you see the djembe players out there playing around the circle and they're being they're very powerful with that this has more subtleties to it so you want just that a nice little thing now while you're doing this you will find muscles in your arm that you never knew existed before very quickly <laughs> because what you're doing is you're using this whole muscle group in fact if you just lay your hand across your upper forearm you can really feel all those things turning in there and this is your non-dominant hand more than likely which means it doesn't like to do anything anyway so if you do that for a while you'll start to feel changes start to happen in your body <laughs> You want to make that sound nice and crisp, and now you can still play the same particular rhythm, mock zoom, using this sound technique. It would go. following just this, what you want to do is you want to speak it. In this instance, it would go ka, 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 ka. Now, what's really popular in Middle Eastern rhythms that we play is that you have a lot of different variations. Now you just learned basically two variations of the same rhythm. So in a sense, where you don't where if you're playing the same thing over and over again with never, without ever changing, it becomes very boring after a while because it's almost too repetitive. When you do anything a billion times, you're not going to want to do it that way anymore. So what happens is we add variations to it. So you can turn around and go. Then you can start mixing up the different flavors. It's very simplistic, but the whole idea is to get across the fact that there are many different variations of all these rhythms. And as you go through and, and, and learn, you know, frame drumming and djembe's and, and doombeks and other types of drums, you'll find a lot of the rhythms have similar names, and those rhythms will cross cultures, and they'll be called one thing in one language and another thing in another language, and they're very similar rhythms. Uh, a rhythm that comes to mind that's also a, a two, which is what we were playing before, uh, is a rhythm called IU. Uh, that's a Middle Eastern rhythm, and there's also an African rhythm called Django that's very similar to that. And, and this is just the fact of life. You know, people are going to come up with these same types of rhythms in different areas, and count, you know, consequently they'll have different names for them. So there's no wrong or right. This is just a matter of gathering as much information and, and, and really kind of allowing you to process it and kind of come to your own conclusions about stuff. I mean, that's what alternative spirituality is all about, right? <laughs> well, it's kind of the same thing. This way you guys can figure out what's comfortable for you, and then you guys can go on with that and make it your own. So the next rhythm we're going to do is a rhythm called Saidi. And Saidi is based on the Maksum family, and it's just a little different because there's a couple of extra basses in it, and it would sound something like this. It would go...
concentrate is on the bases. So you can even just do this. Because a lot of times that's the identifier of a rhythm is where the bases are. The other stuff is really just kind of fill in a sense. Now as you become more comfortable with where the bases are, you can then start putting the other stuff in there. Do you breathe? Yeah. <laughs> Does your heart beat? And you can play a drum. <laughs> See, the, other, the, the drum and any type of instrument, like a, a percussion instrument, it, it's, the, it's the one thing where you can go up and pretty much have the ability to obtain instantaneous gratification because you don't necessarily need a teacher because you already have your teacher. It's inside of you. It's going to allow you to just basically allow that stuff to come out. And, uh, and all you got to do is just fill with it, play with it. And once you know the strokes, as far as what sounds you can make, you've got your bass, which is the, the turning of the doorknob, you know. You've got your cob, which is up here, and that's your, your hands are supporting that. You know, it's got to be at 12 o'clock. And you've got your tech on the sides. And then again, you're just hitting pretty much with the ring finger for that. And it's still the same type of doorknob thing, just going the other way. That's one of the reasons why I use the thumb roll because I can go down and come back with a tag. So it's because one thing you'll find as you progress is you want to be efficient because realistically, you know, as things become uh, faster and, and you're trying to play faster, you're, you're going to have to necessarily you know, be more efficient with where your hands are. In other words, you don't want hands coming out here, you know, if you're going to go and then come right back with a tack, you might not make it back in time. So you want to keep your hands up in the appropriate distance away from the drum to make sure that you can get to the next spot. That's deciding where that is is pretty much entirely up to you. <laughs> but it comes with time. You know. It's one of those things. This, this is an instrument that you can really get a lot out of, whether in a spiritual sense or just in a musical sense, whether you're by yourself or with your other people and stuff like that. Uh, you can really accomplish a lot with something like this. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, you'll hear them, yeah, this is a uh, uh, fiber skin, so this does, won't, you can't get those whale song stuff, but a lot of times with the goat skins, you know, with, and I, Sean is the one that you want to talk to about that, the guy who plays the congas, he's really good at that, and Anthony's good at that too. But uh, you can make that type of sound. You can, you can, you know, just even get in your hands, just like... you can 
do that? You can use your nails. Do you have nails? Too hard to surface. <laughs> but again, this is just being creative. I've seen him do. on the side of yours, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to show you some drill work. In other words, things that uh, you can practice that aren't necessarily a specific rhythm. That it's, it's something that you can practice to refine and either build your strength in your in your your muscle groups for that particular you know a finger technique or just allow you to work on speed and, and just consistency and, and making the sounds in the appropriate places uh, to work on what, what I call the ka uh, I usually play a Moroccan variation of uh, foof and uh, I'll do it really slow but I mean this is something that if you this will You'll drive home right-handed if you do this for a while. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and basically what you're doing is just going, you off your knee because you can't hold it anymore. <laughs> so it would go boom, ka, ka, grab, ka, ka, grab, ka. That's the whole cycle. You just do that about a million times and you'll be fine. <laughs> I'm a very strong believer that you should come home from a workshop in either physical pain or have a headache. And then you, you feel like you got your money's worth. That's right. The blessing of the workshop. <laughs> exactly. So let's try that again and we'll just do this nice and slow and continue it. So it goes. Yes, even I can make mistakes. <laughs> you did? <laughs> well, I know every mistake I make. But well, we didn't know. I just don't tell people that. <laughs> but you just did. <laughs> well, you got to do that every once in a while. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's a, a good drill technique. And again, you can play that. You'll hear people play that. But if you if you see a Moroccan uh, drummer, usually with the doom back, he'll be playing that. And it sounds more like... something that everybody can achieve that I and mean, it's really not that hard I mean to really get use of your non-dominant hand in, in this type of a situation whether it's for a frame drum or, or for the doom bag it, it's gonna take time it's not gonna take any extra practicing time necessarily what it's gonna take from you is a commitment of regularly doing it I mean if you go to a weekly drum circle whether it's one you know once a week or once a month or if you consistently do that over a period of time, you'll start to feel and play better. And you will, there are become, there are specific times in your drumming career, in a sense, where you'll have recognizable milestones where you go, I remember the exact day that I could play my car and never have to worry about it falling out anymore. 
and it was actually at Spirited Tribes down in Fort Lauderdale about five years ago, and that was a happy day for me. <laughs> and there are things like that. I mean, you're you're just going to be able to all of a sudden one day, wow, I wasn't able to do that before, and now I can do that, and I can incorporate that. And each little thing you learn, and each little stroke or technique that you learn, you can then turn around and and bring that back to all the rhythms that you already have in your vocabulary. And now you've just, you know, increased that exponentially because you can just do it a little different, you know. You, instead of doing a grab here, I could, you know, do, a, you know, a kaka or a tech. And, and you mix those all up and you create these multitude of variations of things you can do with the drum and the instrument. And and allows you to increase your vocabulary, you know, tenfold, overnight in a sense. Uh, and like I said, it just takes time. Uh, another thing, if you want to just work on your, your, your techs and your kas, is something from... Uh, from the rudiments from snare drumming, like just doing something as simple as they call a paradiddle. And all that's going to be is right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Now you don't have to follow, you know, don't watch my hands in this instance because it, we're all playing the same thing, we're just playing tones. But it's got to be in your head that you're thinking the right, left, right, left, the right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. So if you fall out, you can just jump right back in again because it's in your own head where your rights and your lefts are. Because a lot of times people get confused with this because they're like, oh, i got to wait for him his right hand to start. You, you don't have to do that. I mean, it's really all inside your own head for this particular drill. So let's go ahead and try that. We'll start off nice and slow. Now, the way this drill works is after everybody's kind of in a comfortable place, it'll naturally slowly increase in speed. Because one of the other things when you're doing drill work, rather than learning rhythms or practicing a song or something like that, when you're doing drill work, the aspect that you want to work on is obviously your, your technique, making sure you're getting the sounds that you want to in the proper places and your timing is correct, but this is also a good opportunity to work on your speed. Uh, and it's not that rhythms need to be played fast or they need to be played slow. I mean, but rhythms have their own feel no matter what you know, speed they're being played at. Uh, I mean, I've seen you know, Ayub and Django, which we were talking about before. I mean, that's one of the slowest rhythms that are played, and it's very, very dramatic, and it's also one of the fastest rhythms that are played, and it's just as dramatic. So uh, don't be afraid of speed. It's not your enemy. It's not going to hurt. Uh, it will actually improve your ability to be a much more efficient drummer just by incorporating it into your drill work, into your, into your practice session. So let's go ahead and start out nice and slow. And again, it goes right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. You can also go paradiddle, paradiddle. So let's try it nice and slow. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left.
this one thing you that will increase your out? ability to drum in any circumstances, doing those will. I mean, I, I when I was teaching a regular weekly class, that was one of the one things that we did. And, and, and you know, again, it sounds. And I've seen people do performances just playing power diddles. I mean, uh, David Karup up in uh, well, he was back up in North Carolina then. Uh, he does a complete entire power diddle video. It's just doing that, and it's just like doesn't sound anything like that, you know. But I mean, he's just amazing to watch somebody do that. And, but just doing that. That, incre that works out so much. You're, you're, incre you're increasing your ability to make your texts and your cons consistently. Because, I mean, every, and every drum is going to be a little differently, especially with drums of this nature, because you know, it's, it's just the way the drums are. Uh, you're going to find different places of playing it, and you're going to find that nice spot that you feel comfortable with, and that's where you're going to make consistent texts and cons. And it's going to allow you to be able to play a lot faster. You'll be able to do rolls with it. Another thing that we do a lot of times, and probably my doing back class is going to look just like this, <laughs> is, uh, is doing rolls. Because here's something that I've always found that's been very helpful. People think in even numbers, and everything you listen to on the radio for popular music is usually a four. And you'll hear twos a lot of times. Every once in a while you may hear a six, but your, your brain has to start you, you can't count fast when you're when you're doing a roll. Like if you wanted to roll to a like a, you know a four, it's like that's easy. You can go one three four, one three four, one three four. Well, do that to A. It's like one three four seven A. You know, you just can't do it that quickly. So what you want to start practicing is your ability to recognize the length of a rhythm. Now, after you play for a while and you're playing, uh, you'll hear it like a lot of times with the IU. You know, with a. Feel that you know that oh that was pretty much fourth one you know and that's and you get these grouping because the, these the small rhythms like these these twos which is what an IU is it, it goes so fast that it's no sense in counting the individual ones you want to count a bigger group because it's easier for your brain to recognize so consequently when you want to start doing fancier stuff with like uh, you know rolls and stuff like that you really kind of have to know what a roll in six feels like or what a roll in seven feels like. Uh, things to start thinking about in, in this process, and again, a lot of people are not necessarily here, or this is what they want to do, but, but these are, again, these are things that you can work on that are going to improve your drumming because you're going to be thinking about the numbers now. Like I said, a four, which is just a one of the four, one of the four, and the thing that you'll find if you lead with your dominant hand in, in these rolling circumstances, all even numbers are going to end up here, and all odd numbers are going to end over here. So that's another way of recognizing if you're within where you should be, if finding what hand you ended on. So again, the four, which is a... Let's try and do that. It's very familiar. Let me play this on your steering wheel. Your desk. The arms of your chair. change that. Okay. <laughs> we're now stepping away from the light, across the line, and now we're going to roll in other numbers. And again, this is just to make your brain actually hear this and what it sounds like so that it'll start to recognize these patterns. So if we were going to roll in five, we know a couple of things right off the bat. You're going to end with the hand, your, your right hand because you're going to go one, two, three, four, five.
good. We're going to do a six now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Enough. And again, now we know a few things to start off with. We can increase your comfort level for the reason you know, okay, it's going to end on my left hand because it's an even number. So, and, all, and six is something that we can still physically go one, two, three, four, five, six without having to sound, what do you do? <laughs> so it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. You're like, hey, it wasn't a five, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if nothing else I've learned I need to do for drum. Because I can't hold it still enough and still get the fingers. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's one of those things, you know, and you'll find ways around that a lot of times. You can, you know, maybe your hands just need to be close together. I mean, like that, each, each drum is going to really demonstrate some unique attributes that you can really only do by just you know, fiddling with it pretty much and, and figuring out what's where it's comfortable. I mean, sometimes the smaller drums might be easier to be held up here, you know, or, or stuff like that. But each drum is going to have its own unique stuff that you're going to have to kind of you know, come to some mutual compromise with, you know. Uh, the next number would be a seven. So what do we know about the fact that it's a seven to raise our comfortability level? Yes? It's going to end on your right hand. Very good. That's why she's sitting over there. <laughs> <laughs> so it would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. sound like the rules that these people do or they play on things, that sounds like we're just going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And, and it is, in a sense, because to do the, the, the fancy rolls that you'll see a lot of people do, it's not so much that you're just playing it fast, though. It's also the fact that you're squinching them together. So if we go back to the fours, which is something that's, that, that is easier to do and easy to see, where we're going one, two, three, four. So if you start squishing them together, it's like... different than one, two, three, four. But if you do it fast and together, and it is no difference between that and it's just the fact that when you squish them together, you know, you have to be more comfortable in doing it, and your hands become a little more efficient in playing it, but it's still just Good way to learn the types of drum rolls is through uh, is like the nursery rhymes. The first roll I ever learned was the uh, the uh, how much woodchuck could a woodchuck chuck of a woodchuck could chuck wood. <laughs> and you can take any stuff like that that has a, a simple repeating pattern to it and translate it over to your drum. And this is true for djembe's or djumbex. And, and the same thing with the rolls. I mean, if your predominant instrument is not going to be the frame drum, all that drill stuff that I just showed you will work perfectly for that. But the uh, the woodchuck roll, which is kind of what I'll call it now, <laughs> that sounded kind of cool. 
goes, uh, how much wood can a woodchuck chuck? So if you have a particular favorite, you can use that to whatever the, uh, what was the one about the baby belly and the bumper or something like that? Rubber that baby, rubber rubber baby bumper. belly bumper. Rubber baby yeah. belly bumpers. Again, it's something that the woodchuck Bucky one just happens to be familiar Bucky to me because that's belly one bumpers. we grew up with, you know, but, but again, and it's just that. speed, you know, and uh, on the fourth cycle we're going to leave a space, and in that space everybody will get an opportunity to do something, and uh, I'll demonstrate this, and if you've been in my classes before, you know we play this game, and those people who don't have drums that are sitting in the back row, <laughs> they get to play too. <laughs> <laughs> See, they had their chance, they could have left. <laughs> You're on camera now. Oh, he's eh? leaving now. <laughs> oh, he's so, hit I'll event. demonstrate, it's going to sound like this, it's going to go. Say nothing at least once.
then, and these are things that, again, that are simplistic stuff that you can really kind of make your drumming interesting and fun, where it doesn't feel like a chore, like, oh, I got to go in the room and practice my drumming, and like, yeah. oh boy, that's really hard, you know, but uh, <laughs> you, when you, play you play have a group of people that get together, you know, whether it's just me, you know, if you have a partner, or you have a couple of friends that come over once a week just to, to do some drumming, or, you know, stuff like this can make it fun, because, you know, you're giving the one thing that a lot of new drummers don't get an opportunity to do, and that's to play on top, because that's what you guys are doing. You're playing on top. You know, you always hear the guys out there at night, ra -ba -ba -ba, ra -ba -ba -ba. Well, you're doing the same thing. It doesn't always have to be, ra -ba -ba -ba. Like it, you just have to be up there by yourself. And that's a scary place to be sometimes. Because if you, you realize that if you make a mistake there, it's going to be pretty obvious who's making that mistake, because you're <laughs> the only one there, all right? <laughs> So consequently, you know, you, if you if you give yourself these, these safe zones with these games and these drills, what they do is they they allow you to to kind of step into that that limelight in a sense, or however you want to look at it, that that spot where you're by yourself for everybody to see, and, and allows you to see, see well, what can I do there? You know, I mean, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You know, some of the best drummers around, you know, they they drum real simplistic, and they and they and they, I mean, as far as their roles and their fancy stuff, but they're real tight because they they work on their technique and they do the drill work, and they really get their technique down so that even their stuff that they're doing that sounds crazy crazy is really simplistic, just like with the fours where doing the rolls where I tighten them up and it's like wow that's that's what I want to do. Well, you can do that. It's just simple mathematics and doing the four and then working on bringing it closer together. But the games like the IU game really gives you an opportunity to kind of bring, you know, a little bit more liveliness to it, to, to a get together than everybody going playing. Yeah, do that for about six hours. It's not fun. <laughs> fine if you want to trance. Exactly. But if you can mix that up and, and put a little things, give people a chance to experience you know, different areas, different aspects of a drum song or however you want to look at it, uh, it, it allows you to get some experience so that, that when, when that opportunity comes along and, and you go, hey, there's an empty spot up there, I can go, you know, or something like that, it's not as scary because you've been there, you know, it's, but it's been in a safer area, you know, with people that you know and that you're allowed to make mistakes. And if you're going to make mistakes, it's always better to do it, you know, when you're hanging out and just kind of having fun and experimenting and trying to see what fits where. And that's really what it's all about. Do we have any questions about the frame drum at all? I've got a small problem with being kind of self taught. I've always done the one hand with everything. Mm -hmm. Well, again, the hand is really different. Yeah, it is different, yeah. Uh, and again, like I said, there are many different playing styles. You know, a lot of people will play down here and stuff like that, you know, and they'll get the, you know, that type of thing going. And again, it really comes down to a level of comfortability. I mean, the whole idea of doing this type of thing, you know, making music is what we're doing. And, and again, like I said, the drum is a, an instantaneous gratification thing. You can sit down and kind of make something that sounds pretty just by tapping away. It, it really comes down to a comfort level. I mean, none of us are, are looking to, you know, get up there in Carnegie Hall, you know, after a couple of years of doing this, you know, that's not what we're here for. We're here for, to make ourselves more comfortable with an instrument, and, you know, we maybe don't want to, or don't have the time to invest in, you know, going to learn how to play guitar or whatever, and this is something that we can utilize in our spirituality as well as just kind of hanging out, having fun, and uh, well, you can teach yourself, and that's what's really nice about the drum is that you can really just teach yourself all this stuff and uh, yeah, it, it's if you don't think of it as far as playing it in that particular way think of it as like wow well, now I've already got one extra thing that I can do that other people don't do you know and, you, and again it's just something that you can incorporate into it and when it comes down to it, you're really just trying to make sounds that you find appealing more so than if other people find it appealing, because you're the ones making them, you know? More likely you're going to listen to a lot more than other people are, because you're going to be doing it in your house, you're going to be doing it in your car, not while you're driving with your drum, while you're driving. But, and by the way, if you want to talk about practicing, when you're drumming on your desk, when you're drumming on your steering wheel, that is practicing, that actually counts. It's not like, you know, when you drink coffee and they say there's no water in it, you know? <laughs> That type of stuff counts because it really is. You don't need a drum. I've taken another workshops just sitting around playing on my knees with a. Yeah, 
because it's just it's your movement. You're you're really it's all up here. It's all mathematics, and it's all up in your brain as far as being able to really see where the patterns are. <coughs>